So in the last part of chapter one, it talks about, I think uh, uh, it's a really good portion of the textbook. I mean, it tells you about what the approach is and what kinds of things are gonna be important as themes in the discussion of biology. And, and the first of these themes uh, is evolution. Evolution is the core theme in biology. We're gonna be talking about uh, the process of natural selection in the next video. So we're gonna be skipping that one and, um, and it's the importance of evolution by natural selection. It really is kind of like a foundational piece to all the biological sciences. Um, we're gonna be looking at uh, two, three, four, and five. And, and uh, they're like on chapter one, section 11, chapter one, section 12, 13, and 14. And I've written them on the board here. And um, I, I think that you know, these are definitely things, these, these are definitely kind of areas, major areas of focus where you can really you know, classify any part of the, our discussion this semester into um, you know, being themed within that area. And, and, and so one of the things we'll be talking about extensively uh, in the latter half of the semester, but we introduced the players early on is the uh, central dogma. And, and this is part of the concept of life depending on the flow of information, right? And one such example of this flow of information occurs within cells as uh, the information that's stored in DNA um, is used to create proteins and RNA is kind of like an intermediate player, right? Or you know, with a couple of roles. It, it serves as messenger, it serves as the structure, the ribosomal structure, uh, where protein synthesis occurs, and it also serves as um, uh, the uh, units that bring in the building blocks which are needed to create the protein. Uh, central dogma basically is um, summarizes DNA, arrow, RNA, arrow, protein, which kind of describes the general flow of information. We detail that in, um, in greater depth uh, much later, later in the semester. Uh, but the book actually points out something neat. I mean, I'll, let me share this with you because this is actually kind of cool because when I uh, first you know, thought about this, I thought, oh yeah, well, the book is gonna, only gonna talk about DNA, RNA, protein. This is kind of like what I was expecting to happen, right? And then and the, the book uh, brings up this other thing and, and it says that, well, when you think about a lot of cellular processes, not just the uh, movement of information to, towards directed towards the, uh, the, the expression of genes. Uh, we actually have signaling processes in which it really is a matter of, of information flowing, right? How do we regulate? How do we do something as complex as regulate blood sugar? Well, you know, it's, it requires information um, that is processed, that gets uh, used to elicit a response that they'll give you an appropriate uh, outcome. I mean, so for example, if your blood sugar goes high, your pancreas releases insulin, which causes the insulin to um, stimulate cells in your body, in, in the liver, in your muscles to take up glucose, take it out of the bloodstream. And that's gonna cause the blood glucose to drop, which is gonna result in insulin slowing. In other words, we've got a safeguard against having elevated blood sugar that normally works and keeps our blood sugar within a normal range, right? Uh, there's that uh, general theme, that characteristic of life we call regulation slash homeostasis. And that phenomenon, that characteristic of life is realized through mechanisms in which uh, information is um, sent out, information is received, processed, and we respond to that information accordingly, right? So yeah, it turns out that, well, you know, there are several occasions in which we're um, talking about the flow of information, although you know, the, the first thing that comes to my mind when we talk about the information flowing is that thing going from DNA to RNA to protein. And that is something we tend to, um, to focus on. Another uh, major theme is the idea that structure and function are related. Uh, now, now, to be perfectly honest, uh, in this particular bio class, we don't really get into talking too much about organisms and their characteristics. This is obviously a beetle, and this beetle is sitting on a flower of some type. And, um, and, and the idea that if you look at what the beetle's anatomy is, we can almost understand what the beetle needs to do in its ecology based on the morphology, the, on the shapes that we find in the animal's body. And so um, 
uh, anatomists will make a big deal out of the relationship between structure and function. And this is definitely a core theme in biology generally, although we don't have as many opportunities to talk about structure and function um, in Bio 110 because we spend so much time talking about things at a molecular scale. Okay, uh, you know, there'll, there'll be opportunities. Um, if you want to take things at a molecular level, you can say, yeah, well, the, the, the molecular structures that we see, for example, on the surface of a protein are perfectly suited. I mean, the, the only reason why an enzyme will bind, do the job of binding to a particular molecule, the enzyme that binds to a molecule of sucrose is able to do so only because it's got a very specific structure, you know, a molecular piece of anatomy that causes it to bind and, uh, and have that molecule of sucrose fit in exactly right. And we'll talk about, you know, so in other words, we can talk about structure and function at a molecular level, although we normally think of, of things happening anatomically. I mean, you know, when, when the biologists hear structure and function are related, you're usually thinking about um, anatomical features like, um, like a tiny bone on the side of a panda's wrist, which allows it to uh, grasp onto sticks and things as though they were thumbs, right? I mean, it's, it's not really a thumb. It's actually just a little a spur on the side of a wrist bone. But if you have that anatomy, you can basically use that anatomy as, as um, um, a point of, uh, of you know, you can, you, can you can use the rest of your fingers to press the, uh, a piece of bamboo or a piece of stick against it. And in that sense, you know, the biologists like to talk about how pandas have, an, have a thumb, right? It's not a real thumb, it's, it's a functional thumb that uh, the panda's using like we might use our thumbs, but it's actually a different bone structure altogether, right? And then, so yeah, I mean, there's a lot of uh, really cool discussions that go along with the structure and function, although we tend to, not have too many opportunities in Bio 110 to talk about them. I, I can guarantee you when you take anatomy, you will be talking about a structure and function. If you take a Bio 202 or Bio 204, 204 you'll be seeing uh, this come up as a more central core theme. Okay. Uh, one thing, one theme that we do spend a lot of time discussing in Bio 202 has to deal with the flow of energy, right? And, and we can talk about a global scale, but um, when it comes time to talk about the acquisition of energy and the processing of energy by cells. We're basically uh, filling in one of the pieces when it comes to um, our understanding of, uh, of you know, this, or, or our use of this particular core theme, right? And so uh, there's this, and, and then there's the last um, section of the textbook, which is a little bit more arcane, but it is really kind of important. And I'm not sure exactly how they decided to use this uh, illustration of um, a, a, a sloth, right? Uh, as an example of interactions among com components of an ecosystem. It could have been anything. They chose to use a sloth. I'm gonna go back to my um, whiteboard screen share. And so we can talk a little bit more about some examples. I wanna make sure that you all have a good feel for what we mean by these core themes. Remember, these are the core themes two because two, because we're kind of skipping over evolution as the core theme. We return to that in the next video. Three, structure and function are related. Four, life depends on the transfer and transformation of energy and matter. And five, life depends on interactions within and between systems, right? Now, I, I, think, I think I actually uh, you know, went through this one enough. We, you know, I, I belabored the fact that we've got this concept of central dogma that we're going to be detailing um, later on. And yet we also have another uh, type of example of flow of information. Uh, and uh, the, uh, the example with insulin and blood sugar are perfectly good, right? Um, structure and function. Um, I gave you a couple. I, I, I just want to you know, maybe give you a couple of more examples of how structure and function are related. How could you illustrate this, right? That's what you want to be able to do. You want to be able to illustrate what we mean by structure and function are related, right? Can you do that? Well, you should be able to, right? I mean, that, that's, you know, that's that next step. I mean, it's not enough for you to be able to repeat 
on examination. Structure and function are related. Yes, that was the core theme that we learned about from chapter one. Uh, what do you mean by structure and function related? Oh, I need to illustrate this? Yeah, you need to illustrate. You need to give me examples to demonstrate that you understand what we mean by structure and function being related. And I'm just giving you a couple of examples here. I mean, we talked about, um, about uh, the molecular example before, but let's, uh, let's think about uh, just diet and the uh, morphology of the intestine in a really simple way, okay? Um, if you are a, uh, an herbivore, like a rabbit or a cow or a deer, right? Uh, one thing you could count on, and you might not have done this, but if you open up uh, a rabbit or a cow or a deer or any herbivore, what you find is uh, usually a pretty long intestine. Okay? Whereas if you look at a strict carnivore, like a tiger or um, uh, a bat, of not a fruit bat, but a uh, an insect eating bat, which is you know insectivorous is also kind of like carnivore. The intestines are much shorter, and 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 the reason this makes perfect sense to us in biology, it's uh, and will make perfect sense to you as well, is, is that uh, being uh, a carnivore, you're eating a diet that is far more digestible, it's far easier to convert uh, meat material, animal material into animal material, right? You, you are basically feeding your own animal and uh, the, the parts that you get from breaking down meat food is easier to take in and we don't need to have a really long digestive system. If you're an herbivore and you're taking in mostly plant material, plant material is harder to digest. You need to uh, process it more and having a longer intestine is, uh, is what's required, right? Um, uh, this is true for um, mammals, it's true for uh, birds, it's true for other kinds of dinosaurs besides birds. Um, all of those um, herb herbivorous dinosaurs had big pot bellies. They don't show you that because pot bellies don't, um, don't uh, fossilize that well, whereas the carnivorous um, dinosaurs tended to have you know, less pot bellied uh, anatomies relative to what the herbivores did. I mean, you know, this is a theme that we can always relate to. And what we're saying here is that this anatomical feature, this uh, structure is related to the function, the different, here we're talking about different functionalities of digesting a diet rich in meat versus a diet that's almost entirely consisting of um, plant matter, okay? You see that connection? How does structure relate to function? How does function relate to structure? They go, they go really nicely. Another really good example would be feathers, right? You know, how is a feather, how is just the structure of a feather um, making sense with regard to what feather has to do? You might start off, well, what does a feather have to do? Now, well, I'm going to say one might be insulation. Okay, because the bird's body is warm compared to the outside world and the bird does not really want to lose all that heat to the outside world. So it has a layer of feathers on the outside to keep it warm on the inside. Why is the structure of a feather really good? I mean, when you, what, how do these things make sense? Well, I mean, uh, trapped air, trapped air is a very poor uh, conductor of heat. And so if you have um, any amount of trapped air between you and a heat source, you don't feel the heat source as much. Or if you have a layer of trapped air between you and a cold soft drink, like uh, like a foam insulator, then you don't have as much heat transferred between your fingers and the cold beverage. And so your beverage stays cold longer, right? Uh, same idea, feathers trap air, um, that makes sense. But they also have to give um, an aerodynamic Uh, characteristic, especially some feathers where you've got, uh, well, you've got like this one side of the feather that tends to be more rigid. You've got, you know, rid more harder, uh, 
fiber, fibers on the other side might be a little bit longer, right? And, and this would be on the side of the bird's wings that are, and it's gonna be facing the wind in this direction. And see, so you've got that aerodynamic shape. I mean, the structure of a feather is enough to tell us that the bird is capable of flight or is not using the feathers for, for flight and is using it only for insulation, right? And yeah, so in other words, yeah, you, you, you can look simply at the structure and um, make determinations about the function. You can think about the function and understand features about the structure of even a body part, like a, a single feather has got both of this relation, has got the relationship between structure and function really nicely um, demonstrated for us. Okay. Okay, now uh, the fourth one, uh, life depends on the transfer and transformation of energy and matter, okay? Um, this is a topic for later on, but energy and matter are two things that physicists care a lot about. Uh, they are the stuff of the universe. Either it's matter, it's physical material, or it's not physical material, it's energy. It's kind of a squirrely uh, entity. It's, you know, there's something about energy that is a real thing. You can feel it. You can feel the effects of heat energy on the surface of your body, but it's not something that you can actually touch, right? It's not material stuff. The physicists would say, well, there are two things in this universe. You've got matter and you've got energy, and that's pretty much it, right? Um, but when it comes to life, we're looking at uh, a particular way of seeing the transfer and transformation of both energy and matter. And, and, and you could, you, know, you want to think about this because this requires a little bit of thought and, uh, and say, well, let, let's just take energy, right? You know that all energy that is coming to the earth is coming from the sun. And how does that energy get converted into the energy that you need in order to move around, right? You, you're moving around right now, right? You're um, even in the slightest way, every move you make is, uh, has to be powered by ATP energy. Where does that energy come from, right? The energy to power movement. Well, you get your energy uh, from the food that you eat, right? The, the, the food that you eat is converted into waste molecules. And that conversion of food molecules into waste molecules is what's providing the chemical energy that your cells are using to move around, right? And to transport stuff and to carry out chemical reactions. In other words, your cells are requiring lots of energy in order to do all the things that you need to do as part of your daily existence. That energy is coming from food. Where does the food get its energy from? Ultimately, that energy is coming from the sun because we've got light that drives these um, solar energy collectors. We call them plants. And the light energy is converted into the chemical energy of plant biomass. And maybe you're eating a piece of bread, and the bread is basically the storehouse of light energy that was collected by the wheat plant in making uh, its seed, right? And, and so, I mean, there, there, we definitely have this flow of energy. We transfer solar energy into the chemical energy of food. That's the photosynthesis part. And maybe there's an animal that is converting the plant energy into the energy of uh, chemical energy of the animal's body. Maybe, maybe you're not an herbivore, maybe you're eating um, some chicken, right? So the, the, the chicken ate the grain and now the chicken is another form of chemical energy and you're gonna eat the chicken and that food in the form of the chicken meat is gonna be used to power your energy, which is gonna be able to power your movement, right? That the, here we're just talking about the energy that you're using to carry out your cellular business. There's the other question, where do your cells come from? That, that's basically the matter that's going into your cells, the, uh, the uh, material, the atoms, the molecules. Where does all of the stuff that you're made of come from? Kind of an interesting question, right? Well, it came from the food that you're eating, right? The food that you've eaten. And, and yeah, the plant biomass is converted into your matter, or maybe you're eating the chicken that ate the plant biomass and you're converting the chicken biomass into your biomass, right? Um, ultimately, where is that plant biomass coming from? Well, a lot of it's coming from carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. 
right? Uh, the CO2 in the atmosphere is the raw material to create the organic material in plant biomass. So we talk about this at great length in uh, a later unit, okay? But again, I, I mean, at, at this early stage in Bio 110, you still need to kind of understand, well, where, what do we mean when we talk about this? Life depends on the transfer and transformation of energy and matter. What do we mean by that? And how do you illustrate that with um, good examples, right? Good on that? Okay. Now, the last one I think is worthwhile discussing because, um, first of all, I'm not terribly, I mean, I, I, I do love that picture of a sloth. It's very uh, cute and dignified all at the same time. But uh, this core theme in biology really is the core theme. And in, in your book starts talking about systems biology. We've actually talked about systems, right? Let's let's clear the air. What do we mean by a system? Well, at, at one in one interpretation, you could say a system is what we talked about a couple of lectures ago when we, when we discussed the hierarchy of living structure. Organisms are um, nah. or organisms are made up of organs. So organ systems, but let's just say, well, you've got to have lots of organs, like a heart, lungs, liver, kidney, dot, 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 et cetera, et cetera, right? And so you've got lots of organs. These would be two examples of systems, right? The organism is a system. The organs, each organ is its own system. Right? And you could say, well, what do we mean by within systems? Well, you can think an organism as a system and the interaction between the organs. Clearly, there's an interaction between heart and lungs and liver and kidneys that's required in order to make the organism, right? You know, it's, it's an interaction between these guys, between the heart and the lung, between the heart and the liver, between the heart and the kidney, between the kidney and the liver, between the kidney and the lungs, um, between the lung and the liver. Basically, you can take all the interactions that occur between the organs, and that would basically be interactions occurring within a system, that would be the organs, organism, right? You can look at the tissues within a heart and, and say, yeah, this tissue is gonna be interacting with this tissue, it's gonna be interacting with this tissue. That would be interactions within a heart, within a system, but between the tissues within the system, right? And so, yeah, in, in, in that regard, we're thinking about, um, you know, exactly what the book is describing. Interactions within systems, within an organism, between systems, between the organ systems, between, between the organs in the organ system. Um, everything that we've been discussing so far, I mean, a lot of things we've been discussing so far would, would be, uh, could be used to exemplify, to illustrate what we mean by interactions within and between systems, right? But there's another cool one that is worthwhile talking about because one thing we haven't talked about so far is um, an interaction between systems at different levels. For example, um, can an organism here be interacting with something else at a different level? Could an organism have an influence on its ecological community? Could an organism have an effect on, uh, on maybe um, another organism's organ system? Right? Could uh, could like a, a, a cleaner fish have an effect on uh, on maybe a hippopotamus's um, digestive system? I cleaning up its teeth. I mean, I mean, if you think about where the richness in biology comes from, uh, a lot of the times it's an interaction not occurring simply between the systems within a larger system, but actually between these different levels. Right? And there's a great um, video that um, hopefully some of you have seen. 
And if you haven't seen this, How the Wolves Saved Yellowstone, uh, it's a worthwhile play. And so it, it, it taught me, I, I just do a, a Google search on How the Wolves Saved Yellowstone and you, will, uh, you won't um, be disappointed. It's really pretty cool. Okay. Um, there are probably different versions of this. This one is kind of um, hokey, so I'm going to end this and uh, just kind of finish out the video there. Um, this is a really good example, though, because it kind of illustrates how um, we could have interactions occurring at many different levels. And so uh, view this video and think about how this illustrate interactions between systems at different levels. Right. And that's it for today's lecture.